Great, great, great. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Julia. That was a very nice uh, introduction. And uh, like so many on the call tonight, um, a big fan of uh, MIWC, all of their great work, their mission, and there's been um, uh, Instagram and elsewhere, a lot more news about the work that's going on to um, oversee uh, conservation efforts, environmental efforts around the uh, um, up and down the river, and that makes a big difference. Hold on, it looks like we are. Uh, hmm. Looks like my video might be off. How about that? Okay, there we go. Uh, doesn't matter. Okay, good. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm going to guess that some of you with us tonight may have been um, out on walks in the past. You may have participated in talks. You may have been at the Essex Arts Center and uh, delighted to have you with us. For those who are joining us for the first time, welcome. <clears throat> this is truly an amazing uh, phenomenon right in our backyard. So it doesn't require a half hour drive to Plum Island, uh, maybe to go see a snowy owl, but this is an amazing avian phenomenon right in our backyard. Um, for those who would like more background information, uh, all of that's available on the blog. As just a bit of personal background, married for 36 years, three children, four grandchildren. At the moment, they all have COVID, so that's a tough spot for them. I am, for the last, uh, coming up on 12 years, I have been the uh, Roman Catholic chaplain at Lawrence General Hospital, and prior to that, I did about a year and a half of um, residency at Holy Family Hospital. So in the area for a while, <clears throat> and by working in the city of Lawrence, that kind of connects the dot on, on why I am able to be uh, in Lawrence with such frequency to be able to observe and document and photograph the crows. It has become an enormous passion. And uh, let's get started so we can share a bit of it with you. Uh, let's see here. There we go. So um, I had shared this photo with Julia earlier. This is a, uh, an outing uh, that took place uh, last February on the, on the right side with the red baseball cap is John, uh, who had been the organizer at that time, uh, a day where there was no snow on the ground, but the crows came and visited us from downriver. And then they landed in the roost just across the river to the left as you're looking at the picture. One of many uh, outings organized by uh, the Watershed uh, Council and uh, a good turnout as has been the case uh, on other outings. This is just a photo from that location where everybody was standing a moment ago if they had turned to their right uh, and it was a, a sunny and clear sky evening, they would have had a chance to see a little bit later on the swirl of crows that come up and out and over the river into the roost. This is looking west with the Route 495 bridge below. Uh, this is another favorite photo. It was a big hit at the Essex Art Center, uh, one of the photo uh, exhibits that we did there. Uh, for those of you in the area, you know this is the Air Mill Clock Tower. And many, many times they will stage nearby and then they will roost right around the corner in, um, against the, in the trees by the New Balance building. Um, a beautiful striking shot with an orange glow late in the day uh, with the clock tower. So American crows, what do we know about American crows? <clears throat> American crows are very smart, they're very social, and they're very family centered. They move around in family groups, not only during breeding season, but, but off uh, breeding season as well, off cycle. They have been gathering in these winter roosts for centuries. They used to roost in more in urban areas, but now in the last number of decades, the roosts are much more commonly found in urban or city locations. And these winter urban roosts are found in cities literally from coast to coast, middle upper United States and uh, Southern Canada as well. Here's a great favorite photo of a crow in flight. You can see the great uh, light under the wings and uh, the feet beginning to extend to go into uh, landing position. Uh, shots like these are, are a favorite and uh, very enjoyable. 
Um, so the American crow is familiar uh, from coast to coast to bird watchers and casual observers, large, intelligent, uh, all black birds, and they have uh, hoarse cawing voices, common sights in treetops, fields, and roadsides, and they'll eat just about anything in sight. They're not too picky. One researcher did a fabulous study about uh, the degree of uh, cholesterol that crows would put on. And she had the great joy of buying massive amounts of uh, McDonald's cheeseburgers and feeding them to the crows. So they'll eat anything in sight. This just gives you a rough idea of the range of the American crow uh, throughout the year. And as you can see, mostly in the US, except for the Southwest and uh, up, uh, along a good part uh, east to west of Southern Canada. Now, the other type of crow that we have in Lawrence, and it's difficult to know exactly what the size or the ratio of this population is, but it's the fish crow. There are two types of crows across much of Eastern US. The fish crow is almost identical to the American crow and very tough to identify because they look so much alike. Oftentimes, the best way to tell them apart and maybe the only way to tell them apart is by the difference in their calls up and and the fish crow has a bit of a nasal call i'll play it for you here and then this is a little bit a little bit of a different call from the fish crow listen for the nasal tone now here is american crow and then one more time. Quite a bit different if you're able to separate them and listen. In the midst of the crows converging into the roost, it is oftentimes very difficult to, to tell um, one individual or a group of crows from another. Oftentimes the fish crows are seen by bodies of water, certainly up and down the edges of the Merrimack River, and uh, they are generalists and again, will eat just about anything. This map provides a, a, an idea of the range of the fish crow. And this is a bit of a dated map. Uh, everything, the, the, the range would be a little bit north up the Mississippi, uh, um, more northern parts of Pennsylvania, more northern parts of New York. Uh, there's a group up in Ithaca, New York. We don't know why. And if you take a close look, you can see that they continue to expand up into uh, northeastern Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and along the coast of Maine. So that gives you a good idea of the difference between the ranges, the difference of the two, uh, the two birds. For those who might have an interest, Audubon, uh, National Audubon in their magazine, uh, this is actually a podcast, and it was a short little story about where do crows go at night? The subtitle, What Are Those Giant Flocks in the Trees Up To? And Audubon has done a number of articles through the years on this phenomenon of a winter crow roost, and it continues to uh, grab more and more attention. So in this little piece, this little podcast from Audubon, it mentions that the crows typically stream in by overhead in the late afternoon in a roost location. They're headed to their nightly roost, and it oftentimes can be referred to as a giant avian slumber party, and that's what it is. And the roost is thought to provide, among other factors, warmth, protection against predators, and we'll get back, we'll get back to a good example of that in a few minutes. Um, it may well be a, 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 an information center or an information exchange that takes place in the crow roost at night. And who knows, it may be a, chat, a place to scout out a possible mate upon uh, uh, to uh, spend time with before returning to breeding grounds. Um, so how many crows are in a roost? Great question. Each winter crow roost is different in size and each winter crow roost, the size may differ from year to year. In Danville, Illinois, kind of west of Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, uh, back in 2016, they had 128,000 crows in a count there, and there have been higher counts in prior years. That obviously wouldn't make the residents in Danville all that happy. Previously, this crow roost was 
uh, located downtown and then they've been able to move it out and that's making everybody uh, uh, a lot happier. And the noise level, if you live near this in the morning is unbelievable. The crows wake up about 90 minutes before sunrise time and they actively head out until about uh, 15 minutes before sunrise. So the crows have gathered in these roosts for centuries. In the US, the first written reports go back to the late 1790s. A winter roost size typically back then in the thousands into the millions. Over the last three years, the winter crow roost in Lawrence has been just over 10,000. And uh, again, those numbers may fluctuate. <clears throat> I have been in contact with um, the individuals who have the crow count assignment, kind of like team or section leaders for 20 of the largest roosts in the US and Canada. Last year in St. Jean sur Richelieu, it's a, a French uh, named town just outside of Montreal. Last year, they reported 72,000 crows for their Christmas bird count. A little southwest of there, Woodstock, Ontario, 57,000. Last year, Danville was 41,000. Chatham, Ontario, which is a bit southwest of Woodstock, above at 35,000. A city or a small city in Iowa, 35,000. Uh, Mansfield, Ohio, my father's hometown, uh, 30,000. And one of the roosts I have been able to visit is Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And last year they had 26,000 uh, reported for the, uh, for the Christmas uh, bird count. So if we go back a ways in history, John J. Audubon, John J. Audubon, the, the namesake of the National Audubon Society, the namesake of Mass Audubon. Uh, he lived from 1785 until 1851. And in some of his writings, he talked about being fascinated by winter crow roosts. And, and the quote is, in the late fall, they, meaning the crows, retire in immense numbers to roost by ponds, lakes, and rivers. They may be seen proceeding to such places more than an hour before sunset in long straggling lines. So true. Audubon goes on to say, before dawn, the crows sound a reveille, engage in a general thanksgiving for the peaceful repose or night's sleep that they have enjoyed. And then parties in succession, meaning groupings, fly off to pursue daytime foraging and relieve the reeds or the branches of the trees from the weight that bent them down overnight. A beautiful, magnificent description equally as true then when he wrote that as it is today, tonight, and tomorrow. A little bit more locally and a little bit more recently, Charles Wendell Townsend, Townsend was a, a physician who lived, I, I believe, in Situate. He was born in Boston, 1859, undergraduate at Harvard, 1881, HMS is Harvard Medical School, 1885. He was an Ipswich naturalist. He was a charter member of the Essex County Ornithological Club. Some of you may belong to that club. Um, he was a member of the Boston Society of Natural History, and he was a director at uh, Mass Audubon. And he wrote a beautiful piece entitled A Winter Crow Roost, and it was published in an ornithological magazine in October of 1918. And in it, he talks about his roost observations from the winter of 16, 2016, I'm sorry, 1916 to 1917. Fascinating. And the journal it was published in, the AUK, it was one of the most influential journals of biology over the last hundred years. He read this written piece that was published before the Essex County Ornithological Club in December of 1917, just over a hundred years ago. And here's what he said very similar to what Audubon said, that the crows are intensely, it's an intensely interesting experience observing the crows returning to their night's lodgings. One wish for eyes all about the head, which is some nights I can't look and take it all in. One has to have well sharpened wits to interpret what's going on. And maybe a well-trained assistant or two to take notes. How many, meaning how many crows are coming in or how many are in the roost? A difficult question, fascinating. So from Audubon and then forward to Townsend, very similar observations exactly from what 
we experience now. Here's a view from the duct Bridge in Lawrence. The Duck Bridge is also known in Union Street. And this view is somewhat southwest from the middle of the Duck Bridge, looking at the New Balance building just above and to the left would be the Air Mill Clock Tower. This is a winter scene photo, obviously snow on the ground, but the but the um, river is not iced over. And this is a long exposure photo and it shows the trees going all the way back and up towards uh, the Casey Bridge in the distant background. Here's another view that's taken from directly uh, uh, opposite, looking south from the north side of the Merrimack River. And again, it gives you a, a sense of the density of the crows uh, in the trees. These are most, mostly um, river birches and silver maple trees. Here's yet another look, <clears throat> a little bit, I was a little bit farther down on the north side of the river looking southwest. And these are trees down past uh, a National Grid substation. There's a truck depot and then a Cube Smart storage building. And this was taken on the same night, a little bit farther down again with long exposure. So you can see the density of the crows and the trees. And then, and then this is uh, another photo uh, frequently in the last couple of years, they have roosted just on the east side of the Route 495 bridge at the north end. And here you can see them loaded in the trees uh, aside for Route 495, just to give you a sense. Many nights when I'm out, I will pause for a moment to drink in the beauty and the glory for me as a Catholic chaplain of God's presence. These are special moments in the city of Lawrence to be able to look out here. This is a photo westward facing city lights, highway lights, glimmering off of the flat water of the Merrimack River and the clock tower in the distance in between the bridge, a beautiful sky with still some light up there and some clouds. And this is just a beautiful moment. And oftentimes I'm, I'm just so thankful to be able to take this in, in the midst of watching the crows. Here is a recent shot of the crows lined up along treetops uh, along Prospect Street in Lawrence, right by Lawrence General Hospital, where I work. So that'll just give you an idea of the different roost locations. So winter crow roosts, many theories on why they, the crows gather in these large communal roosts. As we touched on before, predator avoidance, likely. Urban heat islands, hmm, perhaps. Ambient lighting, that seems to oftentimes be the case that they typically will set up where there's some kind of ambient lighting around them because they don't see well at night. And then again, there are many who will look at these crow roosts as some type of an information center where they're, the crows are somehow mysteriously, we don't know yet, able to exchange information. And it may well be, I know where you could get a good meatball sub tomorrow with extra grated parm and provolone. Uh, could be, who knows, but this is uh, very likely that's one of the reasons that they come together at night. Um, these are photos of the crows just lined up so equidistant, it seems to each other, oftentimes on these wires when I look out and see them. This is just west of the New Balance building um, it, the crows are actually on wires in the National Grid uh, substation. Mm. So these large communal roosts are now found in urban areas from, from coast to coast. They used to be more in rural areas. Again, American crows, fish crows. In this roost in Lawrence, we are probably 95% or more American crow and the balance fish crow. This is a fabulous photo. I was standing on top of the top open floor of the McGovern Transportation Building uh, where the train station is, and where the buses go in and out of, at the corner of Merrimack Street and Union Street. So I'm up on the fifth floor, no roof, I'm looking west, and out below is the extended rooftop. It's about two stories high, about 30 feet of the B&D Advanced Warehousing Building. And looking out over the building tops, there's, there's two sections with a little break in between. These are all the crows staging just after sunset. And a short while after this, they will head off to the north 
They'll go around the New Balance building and they'll begin to converge into the trees. But it just gives you a sense of how tightly packed together they are. This is a lateral view. Lately, we've been able to get up and get drone views and, and it is remarkable how equidistant they are when you have a direct overhead drone view versus this lateral view where, where they look like they're bumping into each other. This just gives you a sense from down below street level looking west, they take off in these groupings. It's like somebody blows a, uh, an invisible whistle and says, okay, time to move out from staging to roosting, let's go. And they move out in these very organized uh, uh, squadron level groupings. Um, and oftentimes from um, South Canal Street or Merrimack Street, South Canal is the little dirt street that runs uh, um, on the west side of the New Balance building. Um, from that location, you have a beautiful sunset sky backdrop and you see the crows going sideways uh, in front of the camera, uh, making for some nice photos. So after the breeding season, uh, wherever they may be located, most crows depart from breeding grounds and they migrate south. They relocate to these urban areas and they form these large overnight roosts. They typically return each year to the same roost location uh, to gather once again. And the roosts remain in typically the same general area. I had an email today from a woman out in Springfield. She said, Craig, they moved three times this winter and they'll probably move yet again. And she also noted that they were on two sides of a highway out in Springfield, Mass, which made it very difficult for her to be able to get out and uh, make an accurate count, uh, particularly for the Christmas bird count. So gradually the roosts get larger each fall as more locals and larger numbers of migrants join the nightly roost. They may reach, the, the, the roost may reach a maximum size by late January or early February. So not too long from now. And then the roost will start to break up later in February as the crows begin to leave for breeding grounds. And this same cycle of arriving, building up to a plateau large number, and then starting to break off, that cycle repeats itself every year. So here's a great photo. Uh, if you remember what we had earlier, the crows staging on the roof, taking off in flight, this is what you would see if you were standing on the duck bridge as the crows would come rounding the corner of the west end of the New Balance building. They would round the corner and then begin to lower themselves in flight elevation, flight altitude to go in to find a, a tree location uh, to roost for the night. And sometimes they'll land and then they'll jostle around maybe a number of times until they settle in for the night. Crows are very social and smart, as we mentioned earlier. They're even more social during the roost season. It's hilarious to watch some of the flight patterns as they're coming into the roost. You'll see these, these adolescent mock battle flight maneuvers where two or three will be chasing each other. And it seems like they're just going to, you know, nibble on the, the tail of the one they're following and just having, it looks like a whole lot of fun. As the crows converge, towards and into the roost, loud vocalizations, both at dusk and, and for about 20 or 25 minutes, and even a longer period uh, before sunrise uh, in the morning as they prepare to go off for the day. The crows are known for their intelligence and also their wariness to humans. So if you get too close to them, they will absolutely uh, take off. And they're also, as mentioned earlier, very family-centered. Um, this is uh, another favorite photo, kind of flight streaming and preparing to go to the roost. That's the Casey Bridge and a smokestack behind. So this winter crow roost and many others is made up of both local resident crows and migrant crows from up to five or maybe 600 miles away. Resident crows are here year round and the residents like and go and spend time in their home territories. The migrant crows arrive and then they get into a daily pattern and then they depart in late winter. Here's another scene, uh, not far from the prior one. And again, they'll go into these massive flight swirls. And this is my fifth winter of, of, of watching them intensely. And it's just exciting this year as it was in the last year. It's just, 
it's jaw-dropping to watch these, these flight maneuvers as they work their way into the overnight roost. Crows tend to choose medium-sized city for their winter roosts. Roost lo locations tend to, as we mentioned before, have bright ambient lighting. They also tend to be in fairly busy locations and they usually roost in large trees, but they may roost on a given night on building roofs, on ice or on the ground nearby, or part of the roost may break off uh, uh, out of the trees. Here's another shot. Oftentimes, uh, earlier this winter and the last two winters, when they were in the roost by the Route 495 bridge, the crows would come from downriver in the general area of the airport, and they would come up the river, and some of them would get in the trees on the north side and then leapfrog to the roost in the trees by the bridge, and others would divert off to the area of trees on the south side of the bridge, and they would bide their time there, and then just before the cover of darkness, they would make a move like you see in this photo, and again, jaw dropping when you're outside and watching it. So they may change locations during the winter months. This year, they're on their, basically on their third roost. The changes may be made often uh, for added weather, for added protection against weather or wind, and the shifts may be gradual or all of a sudden. But typically, the locations of the roost tend to be within a one or two mile radius of this, of this new balance kind of anchor roost, typically with, within one or two miles of that location in a, in a radius. Now, if you take a look here, a couple of weeks ago, I posted uh, on the YouTube channel that you can find on the wintercrowroost.com blog. <clears throat> I had put up a time-lapse, a dedicated time-lapse camera. I was leaving it up there for, I thought, five nights. And when I made the settings, I thought it was going to be an hour after sunset time for that string of nights. Little did I know that I made a mistake. And what I did is I left it on 24 seven until the battery died about four and a half days later. So when I picked the time-lapse camera up, I finally got it, the, the chip out and into the computer, uh, the SD card. And, and I'm going through each of the clips uh, because they're done in time increments. Like, okay, that's similar, got it. Okay, similar, got it, okay. And then all of a sudden I get to this one and I tried to load it into the PowerPoint, but for some reason it didn't work. But if you go uh, on the YouTube channel accessible through the blog, you can find it. I get to this clip and I start to play it. And if you watch the clip, all of the crows are in the tree branches as you see in, in, in this scene. And then all of a sudden they all disappear, except for the ones in the very far right back. And all of a sudden, what lands on this, this perch right in front of the camera, it's not a crystal sharp clear view, but right in front of the camera lands a great horned owl. So we're wondering if this year, the great horned owl having made probably many visits might've been the prompt or the impetus this year for the, for the crows to move and make their roost in a different location. I had heard for years and years about great horned owls being feared predators of the crows. I kind of believed it, but you know, I had to see it to believe it. And when I saw this, wow, it was really amazing. And so we learn each year new and different things and that's what makes this so enjoyable. So at first light after quiet, the crows awaken with growing vocalization, starting typically about 90 minutes before um, the time of sunrise, with or without a cloudy day. They start to depart at nautical twilight, typically about 60 minutes before sunrise. And then by sunrise, almost all of them have gone. There might be three or four who linger for a bit, but they're pretty much all up and out by about 15 minutes before sunrise. And they, they'll fly out in some primary directions, and then they further out, they'll fly in all directions. And in the morning, they fly out swiftly and directly to their feeding and foraging grounds, where, where in the afternoon, it's like a young kid coming home from school. They'll diddle, they'll dawdle, they'll stop and see a friend, they'll grab a soda, maybe a coffee, who knows. In the afternoon, they depart earlier, and they do so to give them time. In the morning, they go out right away. This is a 
wonderful favorite photo. This was an early morning. I was standing on that same South Bank location from the first photo I showed you of the um, watershed uh, uh, council group from February 2020. Same location. I'm looking northwest at, at the north end of the Route 495 bridge and that upper deck truck is northbound. And here's what happens is the crows in the roost on many mornings, they will make this big surge or burst out over the water, kind of at the level of the bridge, a little bit higher, a big burst. They'll go out, circle back, back in the roost. They'll do it again. They'll do it again. And there are smaller groupings that'll peel off. But this is a burst out from the roost, probably 35 minutes before sunset time. And when the camera is ready, it affords an opportunity to get some dazzling shots. During the day, out to daytime foraging grounds, they may travel. The crows may go out as much as 50 miles or as far as 50 miles. Now, of course, in Lawrence, we're only 20 miles from the coast. So they obviously wouldn't be going out farther than that, Plum Island and stop. But in other directions, they may be going out 50 miles. The average distance from studies that have been done is about 20 miles. And again, they go out in direct flight that may be up to 40 minutes in the morning out to feeding grounds. And from prior research that is done, they typically sit, take the same flight paths almost every day. And they usually return to the same foraging grounds every day. Interesting. The flight time back uh, in the afternoon is much longer. They may start two or three hours before sunset. And as they come in, they'll meet smaller groups, hang out for a bit. They'll get closer to the roost, do the same thing. Those, those groups will get larger and larger until they uh, get into a final staging group and come in. They fly along regular flight lines back to the roost area, and they may make uh, many stops along the way. This is a photo taken from the duck bridge looking to the east, and the brick building that you see with a slightly elevated, um, I don't know if that's a, 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 a stair shaft, a stairwell shaft at the west end. That's the Marston Medical Building, not far from the hospital. And the hillside on the left is uh, is the very south side of Prospect Hill. This is a, a swarm of them coming in. And sometimes you'll see a swarm like this for 15, 20 minutes coming back in. Here's another uh, shot of the crows staging on the roof of the warehouse building uh, across the street from uh, um, uh, the New Balance Building. So the pre-roost sites these, these staging areas um, range from one tenth of a mile to maybe more than one and a half miles from each other as they as they return to the roost. Uh, and they may be something like a half or six tenths of a mile from the final roost. The closer the crows get to the final roost, the staging roots, uh, groups become much larger and individuals arriving in groups may settle independently of others. So they may come in and when they settle into the roost, they all don't go to the same location. Here's a cute shot of uh, uh, crows in a station area, equidistant lining up on the top of a truck. This is just on the west side of the Casey Bridge. Another beautiful, look at these colors. This is the Duck Bridge in Lawrence. And look at these magnificent colors. And again, the crows coming in from around the corner. Um, recent research was done by Professor Andrea Townsend. And uh, I'll skip all the details. This was a published paper that she had in a, uh, um, one of the well-regarded ornithological uh, publications. And what she found was that, that in two roosts that she studied, one in upstate New York and one in uh, Davis, California, that, that in her studies with uh, uh, solar-powered satellite tags, that 80% of the crows in the roost were migrants and about 20% were local residents and that the local residents came to the roost from about a 15 mile radius and that the migrants traveled from breeding grounds on average 100 to 600 miles. After the breeding season, they would be coming in from all different locations, likely 100 to 600 miles away, fascinating. These are the roosts that I've had a chance to visit, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I mentioned Springfield earlier. I was at a roost last year and about this time up in Auburn, New York, probably 35,000 crows spread throughout a downtown area near the prison and uh, also near, um, 
want to say a Hilton hotel, fascinating. Um, very active roost down in Hartford, Connecticut. I visited a roost uh, up in Troy, New York. Uh, one of the local birders up there gave me just enough of a hint where to find them. And uh, they ended up on an island uh, on the Hudson River. Fascinating. I had a chance to go see a roost in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. And uh, it was right uh, in, in a split set of trees along a, a, a smaller highway. And then one other visit last winter, a wonderful chance north of Orlando, Florida, to go visit a crow roost um, a mile uh, uh, offshore in a massive lake north of Orlando. And this is in a town that's referred to as Econlacatchee, Florida. And this may be the largest fish crow roost in the country. Uh, in the past, they have had as many as 30, 35,000 fish crows, zero American crows. I'm hoping to get back there in a couple of weeks to better understand uh, the habits in and out by the uh, fish crows, fascinating. No American crows at that roost. Um, here they are from Riverside Park. I love it in these large flight swirls. Fascinating. Uh, again, near the Route 95, 495 Bridge, uh, 495 Bridge again. So uh, we have done a much more intense study over the last five winters. Crow Patrol members growing each year. Uh, as mentioned earlier, well over 325 observation nights. Uh, we probably have hosted more than 450 individuals out in small and larger groups. We regularly make postings to MassBird, uh, always to eBird, and then blog postings are updated uh, quite frequently. In June of uh, 2018, had an opportunity to go out to Crow School uh, at the Northern Cascades Institute. It was a three-day symposium, intensive symposium uh, on crows uh, led by national experts. Absolutely fascinating. And that was really the spark to dive in much deeper with a citizen science focus on what we're doing. With that started the blog, readership has grown. Um, we've been digging into much more of the Crow Research uh, archives and been able to connect with uh, a small circle of Crow experts around the, uh, around the country. For those who have an interest, this is what the landing page on the Crow Roost blog looks like, a beautiful silhouette of a, uh, a crow uh, against a rising full moon. Um, these are some long exposure photos where we leave the shutter open much longer. This is from that same location, uh, uh, looking to the north side of the uh, Merrimack River by the 495 bridge. Here is a long exposure, no flash, long exposure by New Balance, same thing, New Balance. <clears throat> this is a, uh, the next couple of images. We've been doing a lot more with infrared cameras and we uh, also are able to take advantage of, of something known as infrared illuminators. These are very powerful flashlights that put out infrared light. Nobody, you can't see it, I can't see it, but it helps helps light up any kind of a, a night uh, vision type gog. Look at the reflection of the infrared light off of the crows. They are on the ice on the west side of the dam uh, in Lawrence. Uh, two, two bridges over from the Duck Bridge. Um, they were all out on the ice one night. They ended up going to trees later and uh, they reflected back the infrared uh, lighting. Here's an infrared image well after dark uh, over at Route 495. And here's a close up again using infrared camera and infrared imaging. It really helps us to be able to much better understand um, and get uh, crisper photos after dark. Uh, here's another photo taken recently from Prospect Street. We've also been able to deploy drones. We've worked with some of the top um, conservation drone experts in the country, and they've provided us excellent protocols to work with. This is a, a, an interesting view. The drone is going um, east to west and looking down at the trees in front of the New Balance building. You get a sense of the equidistant spacing of the crows in these trees along the New Balance building. Here is uh, a, a look from <clears throat> South Canal Street, uh, the truck depot, they're on the ground. If you look carefully, the crows are also in the tops of the trees along the river uh, a little bit farther back. Um, here's another uh, overhead uh, uh, aerial image on one of the warehouse buildings. And when they, when they land and um, uh, stage on these buildings, we're able to get better photos and, that, and we're able to do much more accurate counts. Um, look at this, beautiful contrast between the crows. And again, fascinating that equidistant uh, spacing between the crows. Um, Julia will be done in just a minute. 
Um, and here's another view. We had no idea that the crows would gather on top of the New Balance uh, roof deck, but by using some of this aerial imaging, we're able to uh, better understand um, staging locations. Um, I'm going to just go through this real quickly. 2017 uh, 18, they were at the New Balance building. They moved up by the Great Dam and then all over Methuen. 28 2019, again, they started at New Balance. They went to the Great Stone Dam, then up to the, the boathouse, uh, and then again all over Methuen, and they came back. 2019 2020, they started again in New Balance. They moved east along the Merrimack River, up around the Prospect Hill area, and they settled in that area on the east side of Route 495 with the airport nearby. 2021, they started New Balance. They moved up river to the west. They settled around the Great Stone Dam, and uh, they were staging around the Bashara Boathouse, and uh, they, they stayed up in that area. And um, just absolutely fascinating. This year, they started New Balance, and then they worked their way eastward and then zigzag now back up by the hospital. We have been involved in many community activities. It would be an hour to walk you through all of that. A number of exhibits at the Essex Art Center, newspaper articles, cable TV coverage. Uh, we've engaged uh, um, grade school students at the Boys and Girls Club. And we continue to do work with the Green Team, which is a group of high schoolers at uh, Groundwork Lawrence. Uh, Mass Audubon Society was up the first up was up visiting the first year with their top leadership donors. Uh, we hold dearly uh, working with the Watershed Council, uh, Merrimack River Bird Club, uh, Avis, uh, the Brookline Brookline Bird Club, and um, and others as well. This is a photo here. Take a look, and in your head, guess how many numbers, how many crows do you think there might be? If you take a look in the top left-hand corner, there are three lines. They're kind of tough to see and small in print. And uh, I think what you'll see, I think the number is 3,045. We're now using automated counting so uh, software. And if we have enough of a contrast between the crows and the background, we're able to, to um, adjust the software for the size of the subject that we're counting to get a very accurate count. Now, once we do a count like this, we go back through and hand count it. And typically the, the variation is two, 3%. So that's, that's, a, that's what 3000 plus crows look like on a rooftop. Here is another uh, use of the counting software. Take a look at the picture. Um, the numbers are not 100% accurate. I've gone through this one. It's actually closer to 1100, but that quickly if you're looking at a group of crows in the sky, that's quickly what about 1100 would look like. Next one, this is a little bit more than 450 crows. Um, easily you could have looked at this and said, oh, I don't know, 200, maybe 300. So it's really fascinating to be able to count them both by hand and with an automated uh, tool adjusted to this size bird. And it really helps us um, do a much better job of, of having more accurate and reliable uh, counts and estimates. Here we have a massive swirl, uh, just over 2,000 crows. Fascinating. This was up by the uh, baseball field on Incinerator Road by the pre-release center. Uh, finishing up, uh, this is a new winter crow roost counting guide. It's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. It's just going through uh, final revisions, and that'll be very exciting. Uh, we put it out to John Kreischer, who's a retired biology professor. Here's what he said. The guide is outstanding. I love it. It hits just the right spot between hardcore science and amateur birding. Wonderfully constructed. I would use it in my class if I still had one. He's retired. Birds are difficult to count, and your guide provides sound instruction. Well, now, not overwhelming you know, counters. You show that practice counting is possible with a bit of practice. Job well done. And John is the author of this recently published book in the Peterson Guide series. This one is on bird behavior. Uh, terrific guy, good friend, and uh, he provides praise and applause for the new counting guide. We'll announce that. We have just launched a, a new podcast. Uh, take a look at the blog. We've been uh, already had Crow Masters from across the country. We have more people lined up and all kinds of topics that we'll cover. Uh, this is what it looks like um, uh, if you go to... Oh, I forget if that is simple cast. Anyways, that just gives you a sense. So thank you very much. Uh, go take a look at the blog, wintercrowroost.com. We're on Instagram at winterroost. Regular postings on Mass Bird, eBird all the time. 
Uh, the podca podcast has been launched. We will be adding new episodes. We have a children's book coming uh, sometime later this spring, and we have a photo guide that is published. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see you all out there, and I will turn it uh, back over to uh, Julia, and thanks again to uh, uh, Middlesex River Watershed Council. Julia, all yours. Thank you so much, Craig. I just learned a whole lot, um, and we've got lots of awesome questions. So I'm just gonna rapid fire. Um, you can give us the answers. Um, first question, could you take a minute to define the term roost both as a noun and as an action? So a roost would be a gathering in, in this um, context. A roost would be a, 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 a gathering, a large gathering of birds in a, in a defined overnight location. Um, starlings roost, robins roost, uh, a number of other birds roost, but a roost would be a gathering, an overnight roost would be a gathering of birds in a repeated separate location um, used over and over again. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what do we know about crow intelligence? So that's another half hour answer, we'll keep it short. Um, there are those who are much smarter than myself who have done a great deal of research. Corvids as a family of birds, um, including blue jays and others, are known, have repeatedly been subjected to a variety of different tests to be able to measure um, task uh, capabilities and that kind of thing. Corvids, crows, known to be very, very smart. And um, the latest podcast is with Dr. Christian Roots. He's a biology professor that had been visiting at Radcliffe and then needed to depart early when COVID hit. He was doing a sabbatical year. I had a chance to get to know him. He was up to visit the roost and he's on the podcast. He does intensive study of another type of crow, a new Caledonian crow, which is only found in New Caledonia, an island 700 miles off of the uh, east coast of Australia. And these birds are smarter than, than our local crows. They know how to... Um, make tools, fashion um, sticks and plant stems. They know how to make tools and use them to extract um, food, for example, under a piece of bark or in a hole that they can't get their bill. They make these tools, they put a, a fish hook on the end and they use them to be able to get food. And uh, Christian Roots is, is just releasing a paper that says that they now have studied that the crows, the New Caledonian crows, will take those tools and store them to be used again. So a great deal of research has been done and the crows are much smarter than other birds. Awesome. Um, the next question is, has the crow population in Lawrence grown? Awesome, terrific question. <laughs> we, we can't be sure because up until a couple of years ago, there was no dedicated group that for the Christmas bird count, which is an annual event across the United States where groups in a defined 15 mile radius circle go out and count all the different birds in an area. The roost in Lawrence takes place uh, at the right time when this takes place. So we only have numbers here for the last couple of years. As best we know, there's been a roost here for decades, uh, but we don't know those numbers. Uh, we do know that for the last couple of years, we've had more than 10,000, but we can't say for sure exactly uh, what, those, what those numbers are. Great. Um, well, another question that just came in is uh, what are, the crow's natural predators around the Merrimack Valley area? So for the most part, what we know is, um, uh, I just wanna look at something here. Um, the, I'm sorry, repeat the question one more time, Julia. 
Yeah, um, what are the crow's natural predators around here? So it's a great question. If you're out and about during the daytime, they will spar and tangle most often with red tail hawks. They will spar and tangle with blue jays. Uh, they will spar and tangle with other types of hawks and falcons. But all of the research that, that has been written, that has been done and, and has been written, points to the great horned owl as its most feared predator. And we just saw a picture, and you can go take a look at the video. Um, they're very afraid of the great horned owls. And the great horned owls, if, if a great horned owl grabs one of them, uh, you know, it'll typically rip their head off, and, uh, and that's game over. So great horned owl would be the biggest predator. I think our last question for the night um, is going to be, do crows mate for life for a certain period of time? They mate for a certain period of time. I, I'm not enough of an expert on their breeding pattern. So others who study crows could tell you everything about their breeding pattern. That's, that's not my um, uh, expertise. I, I do believe that they will repeat many years in a row, but whether that, that changes, like other birds, if they lose a mate, they'll find another one. But I just don't know what the historical average or long-term average is on, on mating habits of, uh, of crows. And I don't, you know, I also don't think there's a lot of information on that. Craig, thank you so much. Um, if you want more information about the winter crow roost, please visit Craig's blog. Um, please shout out this event on your social media, tag Winter Crow Roost and the Merrimack River Watershed Council. Again, we couldn't run these events without your support. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, if you're coming to the in-person event on the 18th, we'll see you there and more details will be sent to you soon. And we welcome your feedback. So feel free to email julia at merrimack.org if you have any comments. Um, yeah, Craig, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? So the best way to go, go to uh, wintercrowroost.com. There's an email there. You can hit that. It comes right to me. I'll be right back to you. And uh, keep an eye. The blog postings are updated regularly. Uh, each night when I'm out, I will post on eBird. And then it may take a couple of days to get to uh, up on the blog. The photo guide is up there within two weeks. The new counting guide will be up there. And um, if they go to the blog, all kinds of uh, good information and uh, easy to find me. I, I welcome hearing additional questions. And for many who are out and about, if you're going out and you wanna ask a question, fire away, send it to me uh, through the blog. And uh, if you've been out and you've seen something, I'd love to hear from you, shoot me pictures, all of that. I'd love to kind of keep this thread going, it's exciting. We're so grateful, Julia, to you and, uh, and the council for your support and your involvement. We look forward to seeing you and many others next week. Thanks again. Thank you. Happy crow watching, everyone, and have a good night. Okay, thanks.